Welcome to To Life L'Chaim. On today's show, we'll visit with one of the icons of American television, Dan Rather. Mr. Rather will discuss his views on Israel, the Middle East, American politics, and the future of network news. We'll be back with Dan Rather right after these messages. We're very excited to have with us uh, broadcast journalism icon, uh, Dan Rather. Thank you so much for joining us on Talay Flachayim. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, sir. We want to talk to you about uh, events of the day. Um, and recently at a uh, New York fundraiser, President Obama uh, talked about how his administration has done more for the benefit uh, of the security of Israel than any previous administration. Um, if that's the case, why do you believe that there's a disconnect with him and the Jewish community today? Well, first of all, it's, it's a good question, a timely question, because we're entering the, the first phase of our presidential election. Honest, decent, intending people can have different views on which president does the best for Israel or does the poorest for Israel. And no doubt it will figure into the 2012 election. I don't think it'll be decisive, but it'll figure into it. So that's one. Mm -hmm. it's, there's no, no sense in my giving an opinion which president has done best or worst. I will say this, that every president since Harry Truman backed uh, Israel's uh, becoming a sovereign nation, every president, Republican and Democrat, liberal, progressive, conservative, what have you, has been consistent in support of Israel. And that's because that the support for Israel among the American people as a whole has remained rock solid one presidency to another. Uh, frankly, I don't think there's been a whole lot of difference. There have been nuances and difference, but the mm -hmm. core thing has remained the same. Every president we've had uh, since Truman, and that includes the present president and his uh, Republican predecessors, has been solidly pro-Israel. So when people discuss this, they're really talking about things on the margin, and I think that's very important to mm -hmm. keep in mind. Now, as to the second part of your question, about what you called, and I'll put it in quotation marks, the disconnect between President Obama and the Jewish community. Um, it's my personal opinion that that's probably an overstatement to say there's been a disconnect because it's too broad a generality. Mm -hmm. I don't mean it critically the question, but too broad a generality. Because we're, you know, we're a country of uh, 320 million people, big continental country, mm -hmm. with a lot of differences of opinions, and again, I use the word nuance, with a lot of differences of opinions, nuanced. That I do think that compared to recent previous Democratic candidates, uh, that would include Kerry, uh, Mondale, no, go on way back to Mondale, if you will, but Gore, and President Clinton, uh, that there are more, there's more skepticism about President Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, I consider that a fact, that there's more skepticism about him. We can spend the rest of the afternoon talking about why that is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's fair to say that on his record, that one reason is that it's been very hard uh, to figure out, he, he's gone in fits and starts with policy toward Israel. And I think that's part of it. I think another part of it, and let's have it out for what it is, um, that uh, he's a person of color. Uh, he doesn't have a background in Middle East studies, hasn't traveled the Middle East broadly. I think all of that figures in into it. Look, it's, also it, true, excuse me, it's, sure. it's also true that this is an especially delicate and dangerous moment for Israel. Mm -hmm. And for those such as myself uh, who believe in the American commitment to Israel, uh, this recognition that this is not just another time for Israel. Uh, it's a particularly, as I say, it's a very delicate time and a very dangerous time. Therefore, uh, those Americans of Jewish heritage who care greatly about Israel uh, are more, they're watching closer and tend to be more critical, I think. But I come back to the basic thing, and I know you have a following question, but I come back to the basic thing. No one should misunderstand. Mm -hmm. This president, as with every president before him, is, has been solid in his support for Israel, overall and in the main, because that's where the American public opinion is. That hasn't changed over the last more than half a century, 
It isn't going to change with the next administration, whether it's Democratic or Republican. That's a constant in American politics. But he did make some uh, very conscious decisions in terms of uh, whether we go back to his treatment of uh, Netanyahu um, during the, the one White House visit, and uh, more recently when he, he spoke about going back to the 67 borders. I mean, those, those appear to me to be very conscious decisions on his part to, um, for at least parts of the Jewish community to be concerned. Well, uh, and I'm glad you said parts of the Jewish community uh, because it's a very large community mm -hmm. and we don't overgeneralize. But let's take those two things you know, uh, piece by piece. Mm -hmm. First with Netanyahu, keep in mind uh, that the United States and Israel are not just uh, allies, but we're also friends. We've been friends. And among friends, things happen that uh, if you wanted to argue it, I'm not here to argue mm -hmm. it, that Netanyahu has done things that the Obama administration and supporters of Obama and for that matter other Americans might raise their eyebrows and say, wow, an example being when uh, Vice President Joe Biden was in Israel, uh, Netanyahu announced uh, new settlements. Uh, he could have waited a day or two to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a reporter, I understand that, and I think as politicians, President Obama and Vice President Biden understood that he was playing to his constituency, Netanyahu uh, trying to manage a very volatile coalition. All that. My point here is that these things are so small about, and, and by the way, uh, there were those and very solid supporters of Israel who thought when um, Netanyahu made a visit to the White House that he didn't, wasn't exactly uh, as respectful and friendly as he might have been. My point here is that these are very small things. These are hmm. nits in a very large picture when you get down to personality. Um, on the 1967 borders, uh, that's a, a much more important point. Uh, this has been suggested before. It was not the first time it was suggested. And politically, and particularly politically, uh, with those Americans of Jewish faith and heritage, um, he should have known that this was not going to help him, to, <laughs> say, to say the least. Yeah. But again, I, I keep coming back to the central point, that these are, these are small ripples in a very big ocean of problems with Israel and the Middle East. But come back to the fundamental, that no one should misread any of this. Mm -hmm. uh, neither this president nor any before him since the late 1940s uh, has been anything but solidly pro-Israel. I think if President Obama was here, I don't speak for him. I think he would probably say, look, it's in our interest and Israel's interest to try something for peace. We weren't getting anywhere, so I thought I'd take a risk. I'm just switching gears a little bit, obviously, uh, Israel and Iran, um, with the potential of nuclear uh, weapons that Iran has. Uh, we're at the point of, uh, we all believe that Israel may or may not act uh, unilaterally. Do you believe that they will? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. What I believe is uh, that Israel will and must do what's best for Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, they demonstrated before in the early 1980s when they took out uh, a, a nuclear plant in, in Iraq. That they're capable of doing this. They're highly capable of doing it. I simply don't know. What we do know this is this, that up to and including the present time, the big winner of the Iraq war uh, has been Iran. Iran's influence has increased in the Middle East, uh, particularly among those elements who are uh, committed to Israel's destruction tremendously. But Iran is the big winner mm -hmm. thus far in that. And Iran with the nuclear weapon, it, it's a, a vital danger to Israel, of course, but it is a danger to world peace. Whether the Israelis will strike it or not, uh, I simply don't know. Why do you think the U.S. hasn't uh, reacted militarily uh, with respect to, we know that they supplied weapons and, and, and dollars uh, to fight the United States in Afghanistan and Iraq, right. um, and certainly the, the bombings at the embassies and the, the plot to kill uh, Saudi Absolutely. Arabian ambassador. Why do you think we haven't acted yet? Well, by acting you mean militarily? Correct. By attacking them? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we've had two wars, two big wars, halfway around the globe in Iraq and Afghanistan. And even though the United States of America, weakened at this time, remains what I call the world's only full service superpower, which is to say it's both an economic superpower uh, and a military superpower. There's just so much you can take on at the same time. That's number one. Realistically, 
with what we have been doing in, in Iraq. Yes, it's winding down, it appears to at the moment, but still in Iraq, still in Afghanistan, uh, to, to attack Iran militarily, I don't think would strike the people in the Pentagon or White House, whether they be Democratic or Republican, as smart militarily, and also politically. Uh, an attack on Iran would be very hard, I don't say impossible, mm -hmm. very hard under present circumstances to win and hold the support of the American people behind it. And in a democratic and free society such as ours, you have to have the population behind you. So I think for those, those reasons. Uh, I also think there are other reasons involved here. Uh, that the United States is, is trying as hard as it can to get back on a, on a new plateau, if you can call it that, in the Middle East. Now, to uh, uh, attack, we would call it a counterattack, I think, but to attack another uh, Muslim country. We've already been in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the move against Iran. Uh, I can't say it would be a dangerous move but I think it would be seen uh, as a very dangerous move and not a very popular move. However, I don't want to duck and dodge around this. Mm -hmm. Iran with a nuclear weapon is a problem not just for Israel, it's a problem for everybody in the world. And something's got to give on that front and give pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Can now, you see? What that's going to be, I don't have no idea. Right. Can you see circumstances that have uh, that put us on the precipice of a World War III? I think about that a lot because remember, I'm of memory age when World War II mm -hmm. started. And I think we're on the pre precipice day by day, week by week, month by month. It's probably something none of us think uh, enough about. A, a true World War III, a huge, all global encircling war, mm -hmm. might very well include nuclear war, which is unthinkable. Uh, but there are flashpoints around. North Korea is a flashpoint. Iran's a flashpoint. I consider the Middle East as a whole uh, as a flashpoint. Let us hope and pray it doesn't happen, but I think we're on the precipice, yes. Okay. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I know you, you've done a recent story on uh, your Dan Rather reports on HDNet right. that, uh, that, that talked about the fact that we are arming uh, Palestinians um, to keep security on the West Bank. Does this put Israel in peril? That the United States is arming Palestinians? Well, uh, with, uh, with Israel's support, mm -hmm. and, and my understanding, some Israeli money involved. Okay. Well, however, it's clear to say that the United States, it's trying to keep its profile fairly low, has been. Uh, that's a, does it put Israel in peril? Mm -hmm. That's a question for Israel to answer. We did go there to the West Bank mm -hmm. and find the following things. Uh, you go today to Ramallah, Hebron, uh, Jericho, these are places, as a reporter I covered during the Intifadas, which were hell holes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was literal combat uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and it was to risk your life to go down the street in any of those places. Now, uh, business is booming, uh, security is much better, uh, with the United States, principally United States help, a new security force. It's not, I would not classify it an army, it's more like a national guard. It's not, uh, not at this point an, an offensive threat to anyone. But the, ins the beginning and the installation of these new secu security forces on the Palestinian side, yes, with uh, majority U.S. support, but my understanding with full Israel support and understanding, has brought some peace mm -hmm. and has increased Israel's security at least short term. But of course with Israel, they never can think in terms of short term because although it's become a cliche, it's become a cliche because it's true. Israel can only lose once. Mm -hmm. And anybody who knows the region, whatever their ideological or political persuasion, understands that. But uh, two things about the West Bank today, that number one, the so-called Arab Spring did not come to the West Bank, mm -hmm. which surprised some people. Number two, things are immeasurably better there for the Palestinians, uh, no question. and. Uh, even small things such as some of the checkpoints or choke points have been, been closed. It's not easy to get from the West Bank in. There are long lines of cars and the frustrations with Palestinians, but the point is things are better and there's, there is peace of a sort there. But everybody on both sides, the Israeli side, the Palestinian side, and those others, including the United States involved, realize that this can't hold, which is to say, 
we're in a period of stasis now. Yes, mm -hmm. things have improved in the West Bank. Uh, things have improved for Israeli security on the West Bank for the moment. But it won't stay in stasis because there is this struggle among the Palestinians themselves mm -hmm. of whether, what I will put in quotation marks to call moderate Palestinians, whether they, what their situation is going to be with Hamas. Uh, that's a struggle that's going on there. And if I seem wordy here, it's because it's a very complicated situation. But your question is, does it place Israel in peril? For the short term and up to now, I think it has decreased the peril for Israel, what's been done to build a security force in, in uh, the West Bank mm -hmm. and to improve conditions there. But it has the caveat, this can't hold. Something has to change or it will begin to deteriorate again. And depending on how strong Hamas gets and uh, whether they force the issue very quickly, it could all go to hell in a hack in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Do you see a point in time in the near future that uh, Israel and uh, Palestinians can negotiate peace? I don't. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful. Right. I hope for it and pray for it as a lot of other people do. But uh, as a reporter, I get paid to be a realist. And realistically, I don't see it happening. I could write you a script where it would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, what would that include? Well, uh, it would include the more, and I'll again put in quotation marks, the more moderate portion of, of the West Bank and the Palestinians uh, prevail over Hamas, uh, that Hamas doesn't uh, come to the fore and, and rule totally once again. Uh, I could see a situation where Israel takes a risk, and it would be a risk, takes a risk and says, all right, uh, this is the best chance we've had in a long time, and uh, we'll strike a deal. We understand it's risky. But I sometimes think when I speak to people in, in Israel, and I try to go there at least once a year, mm -hmm. uh, they understand that there's a risk in not risking. If you make a list of risk, you say, well, if we do this, what are the risks? And you go down the line. With any decision makers, the, the least talked about risk is usually the risk of not risking. And that's where Israel is now. This is, a, this is an hour of decision for Israel, and an important one, a key one. Uh, whether to go further in trying at least with the West Bank mm -hmm. to make some kind of accommodation, or whether to take a position we're going to wait and see at least a little while longer, or take what those who don't like it would call a hardline position saying, listen, we can't do business with these people. We have to recognize we can't do business with these people. Which is, by the way, there's great validity in the Israeli argument. It says, listen, you have to understand, we talk about negotiating. By and large, we are, not always, but by and large, we are talking to people who are sworn to our destruction. So what kind of negotiation can take place when I'm sitting across the table from someone who has vowed my goal, my mission in life is to destroy Israel, mm -hmm. And we, the Israelis, are then asked to negotiate with those people. Sometimes I find, not just among my, my, my American friends, although it's true with some of them, but people around the world, they don't quite understand that that's a reality for Israel. So when you ask me, do I think uh, that there's going to be peace in the Middle East in my time? No. Uh, I would hope in perhaps my grandchildren's time. I'd like to believe that, but I'm not so sure of that. Right. When you talk about risks, do you think those risks include dividing uh, Jerusalem? That's something for the Israelis to decide mm -hmm. uh, and the others involved in it. Uh, they have a much better picture of that. I will say this, that, that would be a, a major move mm -hmm. uh, for the Israelis. That's my understanding. I don't have personal repertorial knowledge of this, that what about a year and a half or so ago mm -hmm. that uh, the Israelis offered to put this on the table to make some accommodation in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was met with a stone cold wall. Switching to uh, the Arab Spring, which you broke up, do you think uh, that you brought up? Do you think that the uh, this administration handled that as well as they could have in terms of managing situations you know, in Egypt? I always like to answer a question directly. But okay. I just don't know. But I will say this: they were surprised, as everybody else was surprised. The Israelis were surprised. We were surprised. Everybody was surprised. Now what we have to deal with, and your question is, did the administration handle it as well as they could? Uh, they weren't in the saddle. 
things were in the saddle, events were in the saddle, the administration was in the saddle. And would somebody else have handled it better? We don't know because somebody else wasn't there. Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine uh, how they could have had influenced events once they reached the point where people were in the streets demanding a change. The United States, we didn't put forth the idea of Mubarak, uh, Mubarak leaving office. Neither did Israel, for mm -hmm. that matter. But the people of Egypt spoke. But we do know this, that the Arab Spring is now given into the Arab Autumn. Uh, and this has increased the danger for Israel. Long term, perhaps not, but short term, in Egypt, uh, the more fundamental Islamists are uh, in the ascendancy, as we saw with the most recent vote. Syria is a volcano on the other side. Nobody knows where Libya is going to go. Uh, so the, in the region, by any objective analysis, the danger for Israel has increased at least short term. Okay. In the minute or so that we have remaining, uh, okay. I know you uh, gave a recent speech about um, network news right. and uh, the difference between the presentation of network news and uh, the gathering. Uh, of network news. Can you talk about uh, what you believe is the status of network news today? Well, uh, it's been in crisis for some time. Part of it's an economic crisis, but part of it is also used for an excuse. Uh, look, I'm at the aging stage where I don't have to kiss up to anybody more. I don't have to say things people like. Based on my experience, the problem with uh, news in general in this country is what I call the corporatization, the politicalization, and the trivialization of the news. And those factors have lowered the standard for news. A lot of programs that are called, quote, news programs are not news programs at all. They're designed to be entertainment, and they are entertainment. Mm -hmm. They can be informative entertainment, but they're not news. To put four people in a room shouting at one another is not a news program, not by definition. At a time when we need more, better international reporting, for example, international reporting is contracted. Or even the best news organizations uh, closed bureaus. And this is something not just important to journalists, it's important to the American people as a whole because we know that a free and independent press, fiercely independent press when necessary, is the red beating heart of freedom and democracy. And when we cheapen uh, what are called, quote, news programs and cheapen the news, short circuit the news, go into the Hollywoodization of news, uh, then we're playing with something that's very, very dangerous. I got about 30 seconds left. Um, do you see a point in, in which the, uh, the big three network news, nightly newscasts are gonna go away? I can see a time when at least one of what we would call the big three now, if you want, mm -hmm. uh, would get out of the early evening news business. And when one goes, another might go. It, it certainly is possible, I would say even probable in three to five years, that you would see one of the early evening newscasts disappear, and I wouldn't be surprised to see two, but that would leave one with a fairly good business. Mm -hmm. But you know, things are changing so quickly in news and in everything else in life that I've learned a long time ago that he who lives by the crystal ball learns to eat a lot of broken glass, and I've eaten my share over the years. I'm glad we got one of those in. <laughs> Mr. Rather, thank right. you very, very no, much. No, thank you very Appreciate much. It. Good to see you. Thank you. That's it for this edition. Don't forget to visit our Facebook page for all the latest news about our program. I'm Lee Lazarson. Thanks for joining us on To Life L'Chaim.